Hey guys, welcome to J Reviews. You know, if you've ever even played a video game before, then chances are you probably know what this is. Tetris, released in 1984 by Russian game developer Alexei Pachtonov. The game quickly became very well known worldwide and was ported to just about every single format possible, including of course the NES. So chances are you've heard of this little tune that most people know as the Tetris song. Sound familiar? Yeah. That's in the more sought after Tengen version which can reach very high prices on eBay. Whereas the Nintendo published version replaced it with the Nutcracker. Unfortunately for me, I have the more common version. But the gameplay is essentially the same. So, Tetris. For the two of you out there who's never played it before, the goal is simple. Blocks of seven different possible shapes fall down. You let them fall in such a way that they take up an entire horizontal line, they disappear, and you get points. The more lines you get in a row, the more points you get. But, if you let the blocks reach the top of the screen, you lose. There's not really much to say here. Tetris is Tetris. I want to move on to the spin-offs. And for the first game I want to show you, I'm going to have to use my laptop. So the first Tetris spin-off game I'm looking at was never ported to any home consoles that I happen to own. Luckily though, the game is abandonware at this point and pretty easy to find online. So the first thing I have to point out in this game is a lack of music, or even sound. Is there any sound in this game? Well, anyway, the gameplay takes an interesting approach to the Tetris we're used to. The view, as the game's title suggests, is you looking down a well. And depending on what angle you place your tetronomos, yes, those things are called tetronomos, by the way, they sort of take a different directional gravity. Besides that, the rules are pretty much the same. Get a full line across, and then... Oh, hmm, I guess the game does have sound. Yeah, you hear it whenever you clear a line or accidentally overlap a block. The red, by the way, means that you can't use that wall anymore. Use them all up and you lose. I think you just wait a while and then it clears up for you. After you play for a while, you'll get an oddly shaped bonus piece. If you get far enough, you even get to see a neat portrait of Alexei himself. Hmm. I have to admit though, this game isn't all that exciting. Maybe if they just had some music playing it would liven things up. Okay, so next up, we actually have an NES game. Yeah, it's a pretty popular title, you might have heard of it before, it's a uh, Hattress. So when you first hear the name Hattress, what probably comes to mind is Tetris with hats. Well, it's a little different than that. Rather than trying to get a straight line across, your goal here is actually to stack the same type of hat on top of each other, while avoiding putting different hats together. And there are a lot of different hats. They come down two at a time, and you can switch which side they fall on. It doesn't really seem like you have much room for strategy at first, but as the stacks build up higher, you have more possible moves, if you react quickly enough. The music is interesting, if a bit odd, and the visuals are a little surreal, since you're basically landing hats on disembodied heads. Which, by the way, turn into Frankenstein if you get far enough. Huh. All in all, it isn't quite as groundbreaking as Tetris, but it's fun and unique enough in its own right. Alright, next we're moving on to the Super Nintendo with Wordtris. Now right from the beginning, Wordtris starts on a slightly different tone than the other games. I'm not sure what it is, maybe the old Russian circus theme and the almost ominous sounding music. The game itself is sort of a mixture of Tetris and Scrabble. The goal here is to spell any three letter words or higher. When you first land a tile on top of another, you expect it to stack, but it doesn't do that right away. First it'll push the tile below it down, and once the tiles have hit the bottom of the screen, then they'll start stacking. Every once in a while you'll get bombs that help you clear unwanted tiles, and a mystery tile that won't reveal what letter it is until you've laid it down. I like the sound the game makes when you get these. It's just a guy going, huh? huh? As you progress, you're rewarded with a change in music and a different picture to the right. All involve circus acts such as a bear on a unicycle and a fire eater. I find this game pretty fun to play, although after playing to a certain point, the tiles come down way too fast for me to really think of words, and I have to rely on lucky accidental spellings to continue. All in all, I found this game pretty fun, and if you're into word games like Scrabble, then you may enjoy it too. 
Okay, I've got one more game that I'm gonna show you today. And this time we're moving on to the third dimension. Here we have Tetrisphere for the N64. This game opens with some of the coolest music yet. It's got like an industrial techno vibe or something. Whatever it's called, I like it. One thing I didn't like though was the fact that I had no idea how to play on my first try. Every other game was pretty self-explanatory, while this one had me puzzled. I wasn't sure how I was supposed to drop the pieces. The game must have known that new players would have trouble though, as they have a training option on the game over screen. I'm usually not a fan of games that you can't just jump into and play, but to its credit the rules are simple enough. You just need to drop a block right next to another of the same shape, but it needs to be at the same height too. If there are other blocks lined up with it as well, then you can do combos. If you do a big enough combo too, you can also get special items that clear a lot of blocks. The exact goal of the game depends on the game mode, each one having a neat title animation sequence. But to be honest, you're doing pretty much the same thing every time, trying to clear enough spaces in the right areas to either free a friendly robot, or reveal a picture, or whatever the goal happens to be. The manual, interestingly enough, lists a number of characters, all with their own unique stats. Apparently some of them have to be unlocked, but I'm not sure how. Overall, the game is okay. I had fun for a little while, but I didn't really feel the urge to play beyond that. There really isn't anything blatantly bad about it, but it's interesting how even with its spunky music, various game modes, and 3D animations, I'd still rather play the original Tetris. Hmm. These were all pretty interesting for the most part. I'm not a huge puzzle guy, but I had fun. It may make you wonder though, how did all these weird spin-offs even come into existence? Well, believe it or not, but the original creator of Tetris actually had a hand in making all of the games that I've showed you today. And he continues making games to this day. I heard he just came out with one recently called Marbly for the Apple Store. I wonder if it's any good. It was just another average game. Hey guys, welcome to J Reviews. So you're probably thinking, yo, what happened to the beard and mustache and all that? Well, I just got a new electric razor, so I thought I'd try it out. Yeah, but don't worry, it'll probably grow back in a few weeks or something. So anyway, I got something really cool to show you guys today. Quattro Sports. The Quattro compilations were a series of 4-in-1 game cartridges published by Comerica. All released in the early 90s, these games included Quattro Arcade, Quattro Adventure, and of course, Quattro Sports. One thing to keep in mind though is that these games were not officially licensed Nintendo products, meaning that these games are seen as unofficial NES titles by most collectors. So yeah, the game technically isn't an official Nintendo published thing, technically, but I mean, just look at it. It's vintage. This thing is still in its wrapping. I mean, how could I pass this up? I had to get it. Plus, look at the cartridge. It's, it's, God, that's beautiful. It's like gold gold. It's golder than Zelda. This thing is like, perfect. Plus, it even came with the original instructions. Ooh. Let's read it. Flashing screen, game does not start. Here are some tips if you're having these problems. Yeah, it's just a little thing that helps you if your game's not working, whatever. Anyways, the point is, I'm reviewing Quattro Sports. So, let's get started. The main menu was a little lackluster, just a purple screen with some plain text. But I guess it gets the job done. The first game we're playing is called Baseball Pros, and I gotta say, the opening music is actually really good. You start off by picking your team. Options include the Hawaiian Volcanoes, the Sydney Boomerangs, and the Mexico City Sombreros. Hmm. I have a feeling that these teams don't exist. Not sure why. I guess I'll go with the Los Angeles Limelight, since uh, that's the closest to where I live. It's pretty much your average baseball game, the pitcher pitches, the batter bats. If there's one good thing I do have to say is that the animation of the pitcher is pretty impressive. For NES, anyway. 
It also seems like almost impossible to strike the computer out. Like, no matter what you do, he's gonna hit it. And then when you're playing, like... What is he doing? Switching players? I, I didn't even know you could do that. It's decent, but a single game goes on way too long for me to even consider finishing it. And the way things are going, I'm not really sure what my chances are of winning. I didn't expect things to go the way they did, but how could I? Next up we have BMX Simulator. Like baseball, the menu music is actually pretty good, but once you start playing, everything just goes silent. It's kind of misleading too, because if you let the demo play, you still have the awesome music playing while it shows the people racing around. Ah, oh, well anyway, the game itself, um, I don't know, I just, the, the controls just don't feel really good. I think they're trying to give you this sense of like, momentum and gravity when you're going up and down hill, but it just feels weird, like it's pushing you in directions you don't want to go. Maybe I just suck at it, I don't know, but I, I just keep hitting stuff and falling off. And as you play more tracks, it just gets worse and worse. The only real enjoyment I get out of this game is watching uh, one of the computer players occasionally mess up. Ha <laughs> ha. A little disappointing so far, but... Hmm. Thought I heard something. Oh well. Okay, now in this game, it's like all the players are on crack or something. I mean, look how fast this guy comes in in the beginning. That's ridiculous. So yeah, the controls are a little tough. I just end up throwing the ball around and I, I keep throwing it out of bounds. In fact, the computer does it too. Like, look, there's no reason for him to throw- He's- what's he doing it for fun? Yeah, so far it's uh, not many hits and a lot of misses, so hopefully the next one- What the hell was that? I should have turned back. I should have never... If I knew back then what I do now, maybe all this could have been avoided. Coco? Coco, what are you doing there? What the heck are you doing, man? You can't be knocking trash cans over, making noise, and trying to do a review. We talked about this. <sighs> that was weird. Anyways, on to the last game. Okay, so the last game is called Pro Tennis, and... Ugh. Ugh. You okay there, guy? You look like, uh... You look like you just saw the, the thing from the ring or something. To, whatever. Anyway. So this game actually has a little tutorial if you go to the help option. You get a practice hitting the ball back a few times. Kind of cool, actually. Wait, hold on a second. Is this a tournament fighter screen? Okay, I don't want to get my hopes up too much, but those kind of games are like my favorite. Fighting through different unique enemies, each more tough than the last. It's the reason why I like most fighting games and stuff like Punch-Out. Could this actually be something like that? Of course, this is tennis, so... Ah, yeah. It's just tennis. What was I thinking? So, I don't know if most tennis games are like this, but the server seems to have a big advantage here. I mean, if you're serving, you win. If the computer's serving, they win. And that goes on back and forth forever. Like, literally forever, I think, because I just keep getting more points, and the computer just keeps getting more points, and the game never seems to end. I, I just want to beat this guy and go to the next one, but it's it never seems to want to happen. And I do not have the patience. So, yeah. Yeah, this game, uh, it wasn't good. It was bad. 
I mean, you would think from the box that... Hang on, I'm getting a phone call. What's up? Is this a Mr. G Reviews? Yeah, that's me. It's coming to my attention that you purchased a game recently. Yeah. A game that came off of uh, eBay. Yeah, Quattro Sports. So... You are aware that it's not an official licensed Nintendo game. Oh yeah, I knew that. And as such, well, no. it, it is illegal, sir. It's like from, it's like 20 years old. You know it's illegal. No, I didn't know it's illegal. Well, it I is. Mean, it, it isn't illegal, it's just it's an old game, no, who cares? I'm afraid it is, sir, and we've prepared to take drastic measures. You are? Yes. Oh. So we'll um, need your information, your uh, social security number, I don't know who, your identity, uh, who's, and who's, your in uh, uh, No J, you, there's no J here. You must have a wrong number. I could never call here again. That was weird. Uh, it was probably nothing. Who cares? Whatever. Goodbye. Well, I tried ignoring the call at first, and uh, the guy hassled me again for a few days. Got a little paranoid after that. Trying to look up different places to, you know, move out of the state, go change my identity, stuff like that. I found out a week later it was one of my friends prank calling me the whole time. Wait, the guy on the phone? Oh yeah, it was one of my friends. Then why did you go missing? Huh? Why'd you stop doing the game reviews? Oh no, I, I still do game reviews. But you ran away. Oh, I, I, I never moved. But you, you, didn't you say... You, you just, uh, you had big life-changing moments. You had to leave. You, you, you had problems. Uh, what about your face? You look like mm. unshaven bum. Oh, my electric shaver broke. I have, haven't been able to shave in weeks. Yeah. Why am I even interviewing you then? I don't know, it beats me. to see a review, huh? Well, I mean, I would, but I've been really focused on my college classes lately, and my finals are this week. I, I just don't have time for it, you know? I mean, I, I want to, but I I don't have a game picked out, and my, my reviewing hats at the cleaners. I'm just, I don't even look like Jay right now. I look like reverse Jay. So yeah, I'd love to do a review, but I just... Uh, you know, maybe I have time for one quick review, but that's it, okay? Hmm... Oh. Bionic Commando. I forgot I had this game. Yeah, I think this would make a good review. I actually made a remake of it recently for some of the newer consoles. Although when I say newer consoles, it's actually the last generation now, but I don't know anything about that. But uh, yeah, let's check it out. So the first thing that you'd notice with this game is that it was made by Capcom. Probably one of the best signs you'd want to have at the start of an NES game. We also get sort of a backstory. In 1980X. Ah yes, 1980X. So this game must take place shortly before Mega Man 2 then. Hmm. So anyway, these evil dudes that kind of look like Nazis were trying to take over the world or something, so we sent our best hero, Super Joe, to stop them before losing contact with him. So now, the player's been sent in to rescue Super Joe. So, hold on a second. A guy named Super Joe, our best hero, couldn't complete the mission? And you're sending me out there? Alright. So the game begins with this cluttered map screen that sort of looks like a weird board game or something. It's a bit confusing at first, but I'll explain it as we go. For now, we just land in Area 1, the first level. The gameplay here is one of the most original I've seen in a video game. So, how many side-scrolling platforming games do you know that don't have a jump button? The only game that comes immediately to mind is The Lost Vikings for Super Nintendo, but that was more of a puzzle platformer, and you can actually jump when using Eric the Swift. So anyway, the point I'm trying to make here is that Bionic Commando doesn't have a jump button. So, how do you get around? Why, with your bionic arm, of course! This is the gameplay element that makes the game both fun yet frustrating. You use it to lift yourself to higher platforms and swing across gaps. It's a fun, fresh way to play an NES game, and the animation of your character twirling around is pretty cool. The frustration comes in the mastering of it. Because the style of gameplay is going to be new to most players, it will likely take some time getting used to. 
Mistiming jumps and bumping into walls are sure to lose you many lives, especially since your character dies in one hit at the start of the game. Luckily, however, you also start off with the basic gun. Most enemies take a few hits to kill and drop this bullet-shaped item. But this isn't ammo, as your gun fires infinitely. If you get enough of this item, then you can increase your health by one point. I'm not sure of the exact number, but every time you increase your health, it also increases the amount you need to do so, so grab them when you can. Occasionally, you'll come across a computer room. Here, you can contact friendly agents that will either give you tips or open up new areas for you. Or you can spy on enemy transmissions to get more helpful clues. Once in a while, you'll find these floating packages that contain items, including this cool shield power-up. Unfortunately, it doesn't last long. So the first level is pretty simple, just get through all the enemies, destroy the electric doors, and reach the end. When entering the final room of the level, you're met with a nice surprise, a boss. Yeah, this game actually has bosses. Well, the first boss is actually just a squadron of enemies all attacking you at once, but hey, it's something. Avoid the enemies, shooting any that get in your way, and aim for the computer thing at the right side of the room. After enough shots, it explodes and you've completed level one. Well, completing levels in this game isn't exactly completing them. Really what happens is that you get a new item, and then you can play through it again or grind for health if you feel like it. That brings us back to the map screen. Now that you've beaten the first level, you can move on, but you get a choice of where you want to go. If you pick an area with a white block and a purple number, then you're going to a normal level like the first one. But if you pick an area with a purple block and a white number, then you'll enter a neutral area. What that means is you're in no danger of an enemy attack, even if you see enemies there. In fact, if you try to shoot anybody in this area, then they'll all go after you. All these areas really are used for is gathering information and finding any items that may help you on your journey. Of course, these guys sound nice that they're giving you free items, but you have to go in this dangerous area to obtain it. Seriously, these spikes do some major damage. What's wrong with these neutral guys? What are they, passive aggressive or something? Super Joe. I'm sorry, I don't know anyone named that. Yeah, I didn't think so. Well, since there's nothing else to do here, I guess we'll move on to the next level. And to be honest, I should let you guys know that you don't have to beat an area to move on to the next one. You can technically just skip over area one at the start of the game if you feel like it. Sounds pretty cool, huh? Well, the only downside of this is if you run into these trucks, then the game changes completely into something that looks like Akari Warriors. You have to go through a huge barrage of enemies and make it to the top of the screen to survive and move on. On top of that, skipping to later levels just makes things extra difficult since you haven't upgraded your health yet and may be missing items needed to progress, so it's probably best to do things in order. Like here in Area 4, you enter a dark cave filled with deadly spikes and enemies. Luckily, because I stopped in the neutral area beforehand, I have flares to light things up. Of course, that doesn't make this area any less difficult. There's some tricky jumps, and like I said before, the spikes do some major damage, even with my upgraded health. Don't be surprised to die a couple times your first time through here. In fact, wait a minute. Oh, please don't tell me. This, this game doesn't have any continues? No, that, that can't be true. It, it, it's fun and challenging, but it, challenging enough to where you need more than a few tries to keep going. Three lives just isn't going to cut it. Well, the truth is, while you may not start with any continues, you can actually find them in-game. But where, may you ask? Well, where's the one place you wouldn't expect? Yeah, it's in the weird Akari Warrior stages, of course. It turns out that these little badges that enemies drop sometimes are the continues. The first time playing this, I had no idea, as I've never heard of a game doing something like this. Why can't I just have unlimited continues? Eh, well, anyway, if you manage to make it through the cave, then you come up against a new boss. And a pretty tough one this time. He has a big shield, a gun, a knife, and a bionic claw thing of his own. Man, talk about overkill. The trick here is to get behind him, which isn't as simple as it sounds. When standing on a platform above him, he uses his claw to knock you back. And when you do manage to get behind him, it doesn't take long for him to turn around. I'd be impressed to see anyone get past this guy on their first try. And look at that, I ran out of continues. Meaning that I have to start the game all over. Again. Ah, damn it. I'd like to try again, but I don't have a lot of time left to study. I gotta go, guys. Okay, maybe uh, one more try. Well, okay. You want to know the trick to getting past the shield guy? The trick is to just not fight him. Yeah, the only thing that really matters here is the computer. Avoid him as best as you can and just blow the thing up. You'll get your item and you'll be able to progress just the same. In fact, the item you get is your first weapon upgrade, the wide cannon. 
It's sort of like a short range shotgun, but not particularly powerful. To be honest, it's probably best to just stick with your original weapon for now. In the next neutral area, you run into what looks like the leader of the bad guys. Too bad you just can't get rid of him here and now. Oh well. At least there's an extra life here. And extra life would be very useful, but with those spikes, this is almost like a gambling game. Uh, alright, got it. Hey, there's also a wall here. This is a neutral zone, isn't it? Why can't I get through? I wonder if... Uh-oh. No, 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 I didn't mean it. Stop. Better hide here. Wait, that's what they were trying to keep from me? Some dumb communicator? Well, actually, you need this to progress through the game. So, why the hell were these neutral jerks keeping it from me? Oh well. So after escaping that mess, we head on to the next level. The goal here is simply to reach the top of this tower, but in doing so, you're gonna have to go through many enemies and obstacles, including these little boulder things, lasers, and dudes in helicopter jetpacks with electricity guns. Another challenge here is doing trick jumps off of the lights. You can only stand on them for a split second, so while avoiding enemies, you have to be quick. Hmm, I must be using the wrong communicator, because all I'm picking up here is baby talk. Man, this is definitely the most challenging area of this game so far. And the building just seems to keep going on forever. Oh, what's this, springs now? Yep. And you gotta figure out how to use them while dealing with even more parachuting enemies. Ugh. Finally made it to the top where the boss is, but I'm down to my last hit. Hmm. Maybe I could just stay up here and build my health up killing enemies. Hmm. Mm hmm. Mm-hmm. Ah, this is gonna take a while. Ah, screw it. So, the boss here is a big floating robot that shoots at you. Great. Well, if you're just patient and really careful, it shouldn't be too much of a problem. Just avoid the bullets whenever they come near you and then shoot when there's an opening. It'll take a little while, but it works. Ooh, and look at that. I got a rocket launcher. You can only fire one bullet at a time, but the shot fires all the way across the screen and does much more damage than your regular gun. Now we're up to another neutral area. Oh hey, they left the communicator out where I could get it this time. How nice of them. What's this though? Just an enemy soldier? I guess I'll go talk to him. Don't be hasty, advance with caution. What? Th that's it? You made me come up here for that? Alright. Ah, this dumb robot thing just hit me. Ah, what the- I, I was just trying to defend myself. Jeez. So, next up is a sewer level. Not too much to say here. There's water, there's dudes on these vehicle things, but thanks to your rocket launcher you can finish them off pretty easily. Besides some tricky jumps, it's a lot easier than the last level. And the boss? It's a squadron of enemies, just like the first area. Their placement is a little harder than before, but with your new weapon it only takes a few hits to destroy the computer. Next is a nature area. You have to deal with quicksand and giant spiders and butterflies and mutant plants? Okay, up until now this game was basically an army game. What, what's going on here? So the meat and plants are a pain because they eat you, causing you to lose a life. And with all these bugs flying around, it can make avoiding them pretty difficult. But once you get past all that, the inside is basically like a normal level. Here you find info that Super Joe's been taken to the disposal area. Do they mean the dump in Area 9? Well, anyway, the rest of this level is pretty basic. Except for the part right before the boss room. There's actually some really tricky jumps that require precise control and timing, but if you can manage to get through that, then you just have to fight another floating robot. Ha, huh. this will be much easier with my rocket. Look at that, it went down in one shot. Now I just have to- whoa, did the computer learn how to defend itself? Jeez, that, that almost killed me. So let's stop in a neutral zone before moving on to the next level. Oh, never mind, I, I need a permit now for some reason. Whatever. Okay, so I keep saying this, but damn, this level is difficult. The normal enemies aren't too bad, but when paired up with these soldiers that send tiny drones at you, they become kind of hard to avoid. The real issue here, though, is the platforming. You keep having to cross these large gaps with nothing but lights to hang on to. And if you remember before, you can't stand on top of them. This makes every move that isn't perfect fatal, as you can't really save yourself once you've missed the next light. This isn't looking good, I'm losing a lot of lives here. Oh, thank god, I made it through. To another area with even more lights. Great. Oh. No. Damn it. That's about it for me. I find this game to be pretty fun once you get the hang of it. Unfortunately, it does have its flaws though. Particularly the lack of continues. 
For a game this challenging and levels that border on unfairly difficult, it really needs it. If I could just skip some levels when playing through again that might make it better, but you're gonna have to go through it all again to get the items necessary to progress. This was an early Capcom title, so maybe they just hadn't figured out the right balance of difficult and ridiculous. Ah, that's it. So yeah, Bionic Commando, it's really challenging, but it's fun. The only major flaw that I could see is the lack of continues. I don't mind losing lives and having to start levels over, but when you played and played and got so far into a game and they make you start the whole thing over, that, that sort of sucks. But, uh, oh, yeah, I really gotta go now, guys. I hope you liked the review. Okay, I don't have time to play any more of this game, but I really want to know what the final boss is. It's driving me crazy. You're gonna fight Hitler? Got a little air fortress here. So uh, you played it before? How it made it? Mm, kind of just looks like a you know, generic space shooter, but I mean, you, you might as well give it the benefit of the doubt. You know, you could find it, it could be a gem. You never know. You just might, you might as well just try it out. So let's go do that. So in Air Fortress, you play as spaceman Hal Bailman on a mission to destroy these evil living air fortresses that are on their way to his home planet. Oh, and the hero Hal is actually named after the company of the same name, and not to be confused with anyone else. So anyway, Hal blasts off to the first air fortress, of which there are eight in total, and the game begins. At first, it looks like your average side-scrolling space shooter, with Hal flying on a little spaceship, or maybe it's like a space sea -doo? It just seems like your standard enemies for the most part while you collect plenty of E's and B's that don't seem to be doing much now, but I'll explain later. You die in one hit and you can't run into any of the environment, but you have a few lives, and the first level shouldn't give you any trouble. Most of the enemies for now have simple patterns and die in a single hit, except for these rotating 3D-esque objects which take a few hits, but they don't move anyway. After a short while, the autopilot on your sea takes over and you land on the surface. Either your guy's holding a gun or he walks like a zombie. You are now entering the air fortress. Yeah, that's right, the auto side-scrolling part you were playing was just the first section of the level. The bulk of the game takes place inside the air fortress on foot, or I guess you could say on jetpack. You're free to roam around as you please and the controls here actually feel quite nice. Now this is where those E's and B's you collected earlier come into play. Depending on how many you collected, you start off with more energy and bombs. Bombs are pretty self-explanatory, just a stronger weapon. Energy, however, is more than you might think. Your jetpack, gun, and health all rely on your energy. You can shoot and fly as long as you have it, and it regenerates back to its base cap when you rest. When you get hurt, however, your base energy is lowered and continues to lower until you run out and die. Even walking drains some energy, but as long as you collected plenty of ease on the surface, you should be fine. And you can also pick up some here and there from enemies inside the fortress as well. The enemies in the first fortress are pretty easy. There are a few different obstacles, but you mostly run into these red and blue guys that sort of look like Robbie the Robot from Forbidden Planet. The red ones take one hit to kill and shoot infrequently, while the blue ones take a few hits and fire back more often. The way your own weapon works is pretty interesting too. Every shot you take has a recoil that sends you back a bit. You can use this to your advantage by shooting enemies and avoiding bullets at the same time. In other areas, however, you have to be cautious with this, as the walls may be covered in spikes. This fortress is pretty linear, just use the elevators and keep moving forward. Eventually you'll run into this little red fireball. It's got a lot of firepower and more health than the other enemies, so I'd say it's best to save your bombs for this guy, so you could take him out quickly. Shortly after this, you'll come across a great big fireball. No, that's not Sauron's eye, it's the thing powering the air fortress. 
He doesn't seem to have any defenses, so you just unload on him. Easy enough. Whoa. After you take him out, everything gets dark and super quiet with this ambient music that sort of reminds me of something out of Metroid. Spooky. Well, you just head to the right where your space seat is waiting for you and fly out of there. First fortress down, seven to go. As you get farther into the game, the exterior of the air fortresses begin to have more challenging enemy patterns and start putting the energy in bombs in harder to reach locations. They even start introducing some new enemies, including this big ship that takes several hits to kill, and these little annoying windmill things that will continue following and shooting at you. You'll also start to realize that the inside of the air fortresses aren't as linear as the first one, and as you complete them, they get harder and harder to navigate. I'm talking about forks in the road that lead to dead ends, and many elevator floors that contain nothing but enemies. And speaking of enemies, whoa, who's this guy? Is he supposed to be like an evil version of Hal or something? Hello me, meet the real me. Yeah, he's pretty stubborn, so sometimes it's just best to avoid him altogether, especially since he could just respawn. So this time, when you get to the end of the level, you'll realize that the end boss thing has defenses, and by defenses I mean a crap ton of things shooting at you. After destroying it, you may also notice that your sea dew isn't waiting for you right after the boss. That's right, the exit of the fortresses aren't always near the boss room. In fact, they can often be on the other side of the entire place. Hopefully you found it before you beat the boss. Although, what's the rush, right? It's not like there's a time limit or anything. Wait, is the screen shaking? Okay, maybe there is a time limit. Better get out of here before I find out. So while the fortresses have been a moderate challenge so far, things really start heating up at level 5. Like seriously, you're less worrying about picking up energy and bombs at this point and more worried about making it to the fortress at all. Luckily there's some power-ups you can find that seem to come at random that can really help out. They either clear the screen of enemies or make you invincible for a short while, except to the terrain, so don't touch that. If you do manage to make it to the fortress, you'll find out that the inside has gotten even harder than the outside. The amount of rooms has increased considerably and the enemies are more relentless than ever. At first I thought that these little guys were just making walls to block my path, but the stuff they leave behind will actually kill you. And not to mention this butterfly thing, he keeps following me from room to room and I can't seem to kill it. Seriously, leave me alone. This is definitely a game where a map would be very useful. Unfortunately, you'll have to make one yourself because the game doesn't provide you with anything. It's too bad it doesn't have a system like Zelda where you can find one, or maybe something where the rooms are slowly revealed as you enter them like Resident Evil. Resident Evil was like that, right? Kind of? Well, overall, Air Fortress is pretty good. If there's something I have to complain about, it's probably the fact that no matter how many lives you have when you complete the exterior part of the fortresses, you only get one shot to beat the inside. If you lose, then you gotta do the whole outside part all over again. That may not seem like that big of an issue, but the levels do get pretty damn hard and maze-like after a while. In fact, while doing this review, I couldn't even manage to get past the exterior section of the final level. Man, I can't imagine what the inside's like. So though Air Fortress, you know, at first when I was going to play this, I thought it was just going to be like some generic NES game, you know, pretty mediocre, but it was actually pretty cool. The space shooting elements was just one part of the game, and there was a lot more to it than that. The difficulty does ramp up pretty quickly, but overall the gameplay itself is really fun. There is one thing I'm wondering about though, what would happen if you stayed inside of the Air Fortress after you destroy the boss? Hmm, let's find out. scared here. Hey guys, it's that time of year again, and as such, I'm bringing you a Halloween special J Reviews. Now what game am I reviewing, you may ask? Well, I thought I'd take a look at an obscure little title, and not a lot of people have really looked at it, so I thought, hey, I'd give it a shot. It's a little game called Friday the 13th. Yeah. yeah. What? Oh. You, you wanted me to review something else, didn't you? Yeah! 
Okay, okay, okay. So I was gonna review Splatterhouse 2, but the thing is, it just, I lost the game that I was playing it on. You remember I had the remake and I just, I don't know where it went. I just, I don't know. Besides, I don't have a Sega Genesis, so it's not like I could just get the actual game. Well, why don't you just emulate it? Uh, I would, but I I can't do the whole keyboard thing. I, I probably wouldn't even be able to beat the first level. Oh, a uh, USB controller adapter. All right, you win. I'll do Splatterhouse 2. All right, let's get it over with. Splatterhouse 2. While the first game originally came out in arcades and was ported to many different consoles afterwards, the sequel was only ever originally released for the Sega Genesis, or the Mega Drive, depending on where you're coming from. But enough history, let's get into the game itself. Why am I still wearing this? The game takes place three months after the first one, with Rick having nightmares of his lost girlfriend and the demonic mask. The mask apparently tells Rick that she doesn't have to die and that he can return to the mansion to save her, with its help of course. It tells this to Rick while the obligatory scary Echoes ripoff plays in the background. This is a bit hard to believe considering what happened to the mansion and his girlfriend in the last game. The game plays nearly identical to the first one. You've got your kicks, punches, weapons, and the slide, which I still can't do. The first stage is very simple and is just to introduce you to the gameplay, with red monsters that die in one hit, death pits, and leeches. The visuals look pretty comparable with the first game, with nice gruesome animation, but the impact sounds do seem to be lacking a little. Still, it plays fine, and that's what's most important. The boss of the first level is this big fat monster thing that mostly attacks you by vomiting acid. He's easier than he looks though, and he has a pretty simple pattern, so you should be able to beat him with no problems. On to stage 2, and I should mention the mask seems a bit more skull-like in this game instead of looking like a hockey mask, which is creepy. Stage 2 ramps up the difficulty a little, with an elevator stage where you need to deal with these falling green guys. Luckily, they die in one hit. Right after though, you're introduced to these purple guys that are a little tougher to kill, and they actually have a longer reach than you which can be a pain in the ass. You'll have to use your air attack and timing to your advantage. There's also a bone you can find which gives you a longer reach, but watch out for the spike floors as well. The boss of this stage is a big purple face that drops ghosts from the ceiling and shoots a shoop de whoop laser out of his mouth. Anybody get that joke? No? <laughs> Alright. The boss pattern is a little more difficult here, but you just have to pay attention to what directions the ghosts are coming, when he fires the laser, and to attack his eyeballs as soon as you get the chance. He should go down in a few tries. The third stage takes place on what Rick describes as a foul-smelling river. You've got the purple guys again, which are actually easier here for some reason. Vicious fish, and of course the water that you don't want to fall into. This part can be a pain the first time through, but you just have to be cautious and remember to use your air attack if a fish jumps your way. But can you tell me why the purple monsters sound like Michael Jackson when they fall into the water? You know, Michael Jackson actually had a game for the Sega Genesis, so it actually makes me wonder if they used the same sound clip or something. The boss of this level is a hanged fetus. Oh no no, I'm sorry, four hanged fetuses. And haunted lawn equipment. Yeah, there isn't actually too much to say here in terms of strategy. The chainsaw and hedge clippers are easy enough to kill, and the fetuses always come down in the same four areas, so they aren't that hard to dodge. Just make sure to avoid their acid vomit and attack them when there's an opening. At the end when they all die, there's this big ball of flesh that bursts out of the wall. I'm actually not sure if you're supposed to hit it or not because it never actually hurts me, but I don't want to risk it. On stage 4, Rick finally spots the mansion on an island. First you have to run across a dock to reach it, while this giant sea monster chases you and enemies attack from the front. All you have to do is keep a steady pace. Punches slow you down, so use air attacks when you're falling behind. And go ahead and start punching if you feel you're getting too close to the right and need more time to react to enemies. Once you reach the island, you have to deal with zombies that rise from the ground and these spirits that will curse you. And by curse you, I mean they'll change your controls around so right is left and vice versa. 
This isn't too bad, but it can make you change direction in midair, and you do not want to fall into these holes. You won't die, but they force you to go through this extra annoying dungeon area, and you'll be stuck doing it too until you run out of lives. The boss of this area is a long-tongued mutant that likes to slide. In fact, I think he's making fun of me because I can't. He's really simple. He likes to jump at you to fake you out, but if you stay at just the right distance and time it right, you can run up and punch him as he does it. But that was just his first form. After that, you gotta fight this spider that likes to run and jump all over the place. All I can say here is to be careful about attacking when he stops, and to remember to jump over him after he lands, because he'll zip right across the stage. This is the first reasonably difficult boss of the game, and it actually took me a little while to get down, but it's doable. In stage 5, you finally get to enter the mansion. It's got your basic enemies, purple guys, severed hands, deer heads vomiting acid. Why does everybody vomit acid in this game? You also get to use a shotgun, which is pretty cool. Look what happens when you shoot an enemy while it's jumping. That's awesome. Next, you're in a library with a bunch of severed hands, but the real enemy here is the foreground. Like, seriously, I gotta be able to see, man, come on. After that, you're in a room full of tubes and... Ah, uh, okay, <laughs> I see what you're doing here. I'm gonna be walking along and one of those monsters is gonna break out and attack me. I'm not falling for that. Let's see. Ah, okay. See, this one's got bubbles coming out. Obvious. Oh. Oh, okay. Never mind. It, it's random then. What the hell was that? Well, you just gotta be careful and pay attention to the tubes while you're walking, I guess. Do that and you should... Oh, wow, really? You had me so focused on the tubes, I didn't even notice the holes in the floor. And now I'm in the dungeon. Great. Well, if you're patient enough to make it past this part, you get to the boss room where a mad zombie scientist throws potions at you that either explode or turn into muck monsters that won't die. Just be careful as you make your way across. Eventually, you'll catch up to the boss and he dies in one hit, which is actually kind of funny. Stage 6 leads you to this hole in the ground, which I can only assume is a gateway to hell or something. The spirit of Rick's girlfriend Jennifer is dragged down and you immediately fight a boss. No level or anything. Nice. First you fight a bunch of hands, which is easy enough, and then a bunch of heads that take slightly more complicated attack patterns. Just stay on your toes and watch where they go and you should be okay after a couple tries. Punch the last one and that's it. Okay, I don't know what that is. Anyway, you jump into the hole and you're off to stage 7. Here it is, the final level of the game. This first part is all about memorization. The little ghosts that you fought earlier come down and attack in patterns and it's up to you to remember those patterns and attack or avoid them accordingly. This will most certainly take you several tries, so be patient and just keep going at it until you get good at it. Or at least good enough to survive. After that you finally get to the boss, which is a little disappointing at first. It's just this big crystal that shoots orbs at you and sometimes nowhere near you. And then it sometimes shoots lightning out of the ground that someone with the reflexes of a sloth could avoid. As long as you keep a good distance and get rid of the orbs that surround the crystal, it's easily open for attacks. After that it seems you've saved Jennifer, but there's one more form that you have to worry about. The combined spirit of every member of the Blue Man group. Or maybe it's just a big blue ghost. At first I wasn't sure what to do, and it made this part very difficult, but you don't need to worry about attacking it at all. You just need to stay on the right and attack the orbs and avoid the lightning bolts as they come towards you. After a while he'll just give up and you're home free. But wait, that wasn't the final level? Nope. I thought this game would have seven stages just like the first, but there's actually one more. Damn. You've saved your girl, but now you gotta get out alive. Remember how I said you really had to memorize that part with the ghosts to beat it? Well imagine that, except this time you're in an elevator with falling debris that gives you no time at all to avoid it if you don't know where it's coming from. On top of that, you've got zombies coming from either side. While the ghost part gave you some leeway, this one leaves you very little room for error. I really can't give any advice here except memorize it. After that, you're on a boat speeding away from the island, and who is it but your old friend the sea monster? He shoots these spears at you from different heights that you must duck or jump over to avoid. To damage him, however, you have to punch high flying ones out of the air, and then throw it back into its open eye at just the right height. It's about as difficult as it sounds. Oh yeah, you're not hearing things by the way, he also makes a Michael Jackson sound when you hit him. Weird. Once you've beaten it and gotten off the island, you're on to the final boss, for real. 
It's that weird fleshy clump thing from earlier. Its demon head projectiles look intimidating, but his first form is fairly easy. Get just close enough and duck. Wait until he comes out and then hit him. Run to the other side and repeat. After he does this for a while, he'll change up his pattern and start shooting all over the place. This one took me a while, as no part of the screen looks safe, and even if you survive, he always ends up jumping around afterwards. The trick is to stay just slightly off to one side, facing away from the middle, punch the first demon head as it comes down, then quickly turn around and punch the second one, before jumping over the one attacking from the floor and attacking the boss simultaneously. Yes, this is as difficult as it sounds, but trust me, it works once you figured it out. After this, unfortunately he has a third form, that of a bat that likes to fly wildly all over the place. If you made it this far, chances are you're scared of getting killed and start to fight very cautiously. While this sounds like a good plan, it actually isn't, because if you go too long without hitting him, he'll actually turn back into the flesh ball and make you fight the second form all over again. I really don't know what to say here except that you just need to keep at it. Don't die, but don't let up. Eventually you should get him. And yup, that's really it. You've beaten Splatterhouse 2. So what happens now? The mansion sinks into the lake, and the mask leaves Rick once and for all so he can finally be with Jennifer. Well that was it, Splatterhouse 2. It's just as gruesome and nearly as challenging as the first one. When it comes to graphics and game design, I think it lives up to the original pretty well, although the sound effects aren't quite as up to par. You know, after seeing the ominous and slightly depressing ending of the first game, I was kind of turned off on the idea of trying to review the sequel. But this one actually ended on a pretty positive note. You saved your girlfriend, the mansion is gone, and the mask has finally stopped hunting Rick. <laughs> I hope. doing Star Wars right now, Star Wars, I thought I'd give a contribution. So where's my game? What did, what did my review? Oh, there it is. There it is. Ah, <laughs> oh, yes. Well, it's not Star Wars, but the, the stars kind of counts for something, right? <laughs> this is this is stupid, isn't it? All right. I'm reviewing this. Yeah. So this is X is X X X. Man, could they have chosen a harder name to pronounce? Okay, it's pronounced Zexis. Known in Japan as Kami no Onagaishi Urashima Densetsu. Alright, uh, I'm fine with Zexis. As you may have noticed by the title screen, the game was created by Hudson Soft, the same people that brought you other NES titles such as Bomberman and Mylon Secret Castle, which I happen to own. Maybe I'll take a shot at that someday. But for now, we're gonna focus on the dude flying over the start option on a turtle. I have to mention this menu music though. It reminds me of something on a Mega Man. Good stuff. So the game begins with your average side-scrolling platformer layout, although it plays nothing like Super Mario Bros, regardless of what Wikipedia may say. You attack using this hand beam thing, and when your guy jumps to the side, he keeps momentum, meaning that although you can change directions in mid-air, you can't stay still for a landing. Also, your jumping height isn't increased by simply holding the jump button down. You actually have to hold up and jump. This took a little while to get used to, but it's alright if a bit stiff. You also have a life bar that extends over time as you complete levels. The enemies in the first area seem to be these insect robot things that are dropped off by spaceships, and as you keep walking they'll run into multiple rooms that usually contain hints or bonuses. The fairies tell you where you are, that their queen has been captured, and that you need to go into the mechanic castle to save her. 
Another room gives you the chance to win money by hitting a ghost with your head. Looks like I got 20, um, dollars? Pounds? Yen? Nah, actually the currency in this game is called balls. Yeah, I know an AVGN joke when I see one. Through this whole area, you'll basically just be walking to the right, destroying enemies for balls, and entering the rooms. This one contains an old animal mage thing that gives you a new attack, and some of them even contain stores. Let's see what's in here. You must get a 4 star from the devil? Wow, the devil's in this game, huh? That's kind of a lot to throw at me right at the start. Of course, you can't just find the devil in any old room. You're gonna need to get to it in secret. As in, you need to shoot one of the small pillars a few times to open the door up. I think the devil would be a little more tricky than that. Welcome, you must beat me if you want a 4 star. That's the devil? I mean, I know depictions of the devil vary depending on where you look, but he sure is polite for being the Prince of Darkness. His attack patterns look stupidly simple, but it feels nearly impossible to fight him with your standard weapon. You just can't reach him. You're gonna have to upgrade to the ball attack if you plan on fighting him. Or you can always just buy the ball attack if you have enough balls. Well, anyway, after you defeat him, he gives you the 4 star, as promised. He even congratulates you. Well, see a devil, you gonna hang out later, or...? Once you've obtained the 4 star, you're able to enter the mechanic castle at the far right end of the screen. This area is much like the first, except that you actually have more directions to go in search of your goal, mainly up through the vents. Eventually, you come up to this mech suit, and yes, you actually get to pilot it. This portion of the game becomes like an auto-scrolling space shooter, and it's actually a nice change of pace. You can get power-ups that will increase your firepower and speed, although there's something a little off about the handling. Almost as if it's a little too sensitive. That actually makes it a bit harder for me when I pick up too many speed boosts. You eventually come up to a fork in the road, one that will lead to the next room and the other that will take you backwards, forcing you to complete the same section again. Eventually you'll reach a landing pad where you're off on foot again. It's kinda cool how they let you land it yourself instead of just making it a cutscene. Eventually you'll reach this old floating head that will send you off to fight the boss on a flying saucer. I mean, flying saucer is a bit of a step down from mech suit, but alright. The boss fight is once again much like a space shooter, except here you're fighting what looks like a giant robot bug that shoots orbs at you. Although it looks simple enough, I did find it fairly challenging, but you should beat him eventually if you keep at it. You're even rewarded with a nice explosion, and the queen thanking you for saving her island before sending you off to the next area. Hmm, maybe that's what they meant when they said it looked like Mario Brothers. So this time you're flying on a metallic shark in another auto side-scrolling stage. Luckily, along with the new mode of transportation, you're also greeted with the new landscape, new enemies, and of course a new boss at the end. This time I'm not even sure how to describe it, but just like the other one, it can be beaten as long as you get the attack pattern down and you keep trying. After another glorious explosion, you're taken to the next area, which is a side-scrolling platformer just like the first part of the game. At this point, I'm sure you've begun to see a pattern. As you progress through, the game will alternate between the areas where you need to find entrance to the mechanic castle, and areas where you simply fight flying enemies space shooter style before fighting a different boss at the end, all the while venturing through new landscapes and obtaining new abilities, such as the footwing, which allows you to float through the air. After fighting boss after boss, you'll eventually come to the final challenge of the game, which is to destroy Garuza's fortress, which has been causing all of these mechanical monsters to invade. Here, you battle with the coolest vehicle yet, and a brand new perspective that reminds me of the final boss fight from Yoshi's Island. At first, it's a little hard to figure out how to dodge and attack because of the angle that you're shooting at. But once you realize that he always alternates from shooting 6 projectiles to 3, it becomes a lot easier. I like to just circle around him at a safe distance and then come in for an attack when he's open. Once you've defeated Garuza, that's it. You've beaten the game. So that was Zexies. It's a pretty decent game, kind of fun. I think the main issue is the controls. It's just a bit stiff, a bit sticky. It doesn't feel great, honestly. It's pretty 5 out of 10. But the game has a lot of cool bosses, a lot of cool atmosphere animation, enemies, got, it's got a lot of stuff for it, so that, that's good. Anyway, that's about it. Uh, anything else? Oh, Happy New Year's, that's coming up. Have a, have a good one. Stay safe. Yeah. Found anything yet? No, no, nothing yet. Back to the future. Nah. Okay.
and Dr. Mario is always fun. Yeah, pick any game. It just doesn't really matter. Oh. Street Fighter. And, uh, and the Street Fighter. Oh, another Street Fighter. I uh, kind of think you have a problem here. Oh, what's this? Didn't I give you this game? Hey, what about we play Wheel of Fortune instead, yeah? We already played Wheel of Fortune. Yeah, but it's got wheels and fortunes. What's going on here? Listen, Mike, I'm, I'm really appreciative that you gave me this game, but I can't play it. What are you talking about? Why not? I just, after what happened last time, I don't want to talk about it. You know what? No. You're a gamer viewer. Why don't you review this game for me? Can you show me what you mean? All right. Fine. Oh, God. Ren and Stimpy buckaroos for NES. Alright then, let's get this over with. Aw, oh, Jay Bacall, you're a disappointment to Jays everywhere. So, before you even start, the game is kind enough to let you pick your own control scheme. Unfortunately, this does not help the game's crappy controls, but we'll talk about that later. The game begins with Stimpy working on some kind of invention or something. Because he does that, apparently. Stimpy shows Ren his new invention, and to the game's credit, Ren looks pissed as hell, which is pretty faithful to the original cartoon. So, what is Stimpy's invention, you ask? Well, it's a machine that pays you to beat various video games. Sounds like every child's dream, right? Well, this game's caused me nothing but nightmares. So what's the first game we get to play? Space Madness. Blast off to adventure with Commander Howick and Cadet Stimpy. Hoek is Ren's last name. So for this mission, you simply need to get Ren and yourself safely to the exit. Okay, let's do this. Ren seems to have one attack, using spitballs. They're pretty much just a really sorry projectile weapon. Along with that, you find different items. There's a sock that stops Ren in his tracks, there's a spring that bounces him, and there's catnip. I'm not sure what that does exactly. So what I figure is you gotta get Ren on the other side of this teleporter thing. So, I'll spring him to the other side. And then, follow shortly behind. But do we just get to hop on over and go to the exit like he does? No, we gotta go through all this spaceship crap. Okay, now look at this. The spaceship's way too big. It makes the obstacles harder to avoid than they should be. I mean, it provides you with more of a challenge. Don't you like challenging games? Yeah, okay, but... Look at this. They just have this random crap flying at you that totally look like power-ups when they're actually harmful to your ship. I can understand the baseballs and meteors, but glowing poultry and fish bones? Being a cat, you'd think that it would give Stimpy health. Well, I mean, it's Ren and Stimpy. You know they're gonna throw random crap at you. So after you beat the level, we're back at Ren and Stimpy's house where money's flying out of their TV. I guess Stimpy's invention worked after all. Jesus, I wish I could get that much money for playing crappy games. Next, we have an old western level. In this one, Ren and Stimpy are actually the bad guys and you're going against the sheriff. I guess they're trying to rob the town bank or something? Were, were there banks back then? I don't know. This time you actually get to start off with Ren, but uh, sad to say, he's actually probably even worse than Stimpy. Where Stimpy at least had his little spitball projectile, Ren just has his pathetic slap maneuver. I mean, you gotta get right up in the enemy to really do anything. And what's up with the impact noise when you hit an enemy? The sound doesn't make any sense. It sounds like a noise you should hear when you get a 1-up or something. Seriously, like this sound would not be satisfying at all in any other game. So, what enemies do we gotta deal with here? Cow skulls, cactus men, giant piggy bank, yeah, you know, the usual. Oh, and yes, the money hurts you. I mean, why would robbers want a giant piggy bank, right? Yeah, it makes perfect sense. So all you have to do to really beat this level is keep walking to the right and avoid the enemies when you can. And hey, I, I wonder what's up here? Going, going, going up. So you get this bubblegum power up and you start floating across the screen. Hey, I guess that's helpful, right? Oh, no, it killed me. Yeah, you know, power-ups that kill you, you know, great fun. So when you finally get to the end, you get to battle the sheriff, or maybe it's the deputy, I'm not really sure. He's not too hard to take down once you get used to the bad controls. 
And when he's defeated, it starts raining money. Because that's where money comes from. Okay, next level. Now we have Robin Hoek. And who's the enemy this time? The sheriff again from the western level. Yeah. Yeah, they had sheriffs in the medieval times, right? Yeah. Okay, so let's see what exciting enemies this level has in store for us. Guys in their pajamas, water fountains, annoying fat ladies throwing junk at you. Ugh, she sort of reminds me of the mom from Pink Floyd's The Wall. So at the end, you storm the castle, reaching an epic boss battle, finally battling another fat old lady. Is she supposed to be the sheriff? Okay, so next mission we have Space Madness 2. In case you're wondering, yes, there are only three themes in the entire game. Space, Western, and Medieval. And they just repeat over and over. Now this level is insane, and one of the reasons that this game drove me crazy when I first played it. You have to get Ren to the exit again, but this time, there's all these buttons of various effects that he'll activate if you leave him alone for too long. There's an effect that turns everything black and white, there's a seizure inducing effect, there's an effect that reverses the controls, and there's even the infamous history eraser button. Don't let him hit that. Oh, not to mention the mandatory spaceship section. So there's all these tubes you have to navigate, which makes finding the exit extremely difficult. You've got to use all your items here, it's pretty ridiculous. Oh, not again. Oh, so all you had to do is grab the chicken. Here you have sort of a boss battle with Mr. Horse, but it doesn't really explain what you're supposed to do. I guess you slap his tail, and then you gotta like, jump on this lever thing, ride him away into the sunset? I don't know. Oh, Space Madness. Again. Ugh. Okay, I seriously need to stop now before this gets out of hand. You can't stop now. You gotta be near the end. I thought the same thing a long time ago when I first played this. I didn't like it, I wasn't really having fun, but I figured, you know, I got this far, I might as well finish it, right? Well, next thing I know, it just, the game sends me to the main menu. Ran out of continues, they didn't even warn me. Look, do you really want this game to beat you? Or do you want to beat it? You can do this. You know what? You're right. I'm gonna beat this. So yeah, it's, it's uh, another difficult level, possibly even more difficult than the last one. You know, whatever. So, the final boss of the game, and wouldn't you know it, it's Ren floating around in a bathtub, and you need to give him chicken soup. Yeah. Now you... That's it. That's all there is to it. At least we get a nice little ending here, right? Pretty soon. What is that supposed to mean? Oh, he's suggesting that I uh, get my teeth drilled. Yeah, maybe I should have been doing that instead. Oh, and by the way, you wanna know what happened to all that money we just won? Yep. What did I expect? No, sir. I don't like it. And that was Ren and Stippy Buckaroos. Yeah, see? That wasn't so bad, man, was it? Mm-hmm. Well, Jay, where are you going? Go. I, uh... I think you have a bit of a problem here. Oh. <laughs> oh my god! <laughs> you completely missed! Trick or treat! It's noon. Yeah, I know, I'm just getting a head start. Is that you, Jay? I'm telling you, Mike, you go trick-or-treating early, you get all kinds of crazy stuff. Who knows what kind of games I got in here? Games? I thought you were trick-or-treating for candy. I don't. I, I go for games. Yeah, well, what games did you get? Um, I don't know. I couldn't really see what this dang Hulk mask on. Yeah, Let's find out. Really? The Tootsie Roll of video games? Ah, here we go. This is a full-size candy bar right here. Mm. Taboo the Sixth Sense. Never heard of this game. Oh. Well, let's try it out. Okay. This is Taboo the Sixth Sense for NES. 
or should I call it, Taboo Pixel Wizard. Believe it or not, this game was actually developed by Rare, or should I call it Rare Coin IT Incorporated. Well, there was sort of like a subsection of Rare that was based in the US, well, anyway, on to Taboo. The first thing the game does is ask you for your name, birthday, and sex. Uh, gender. Kind of personal, isn't it? I mean, what kind of NES game asks for your birthday? After that, it asks you for your question. What the heck? My question? What? What is this game? Well, I could think of one question. Finally, after the game's done interrogating you, it shows you this screen of a bunch of cards being shuffled with flashing images. What's going on here? The Knight of Staffs? What? Okay, luckily I actually have the instruction booklet for this game, so maybe we could figure out what's going on right now. Oh, I see. It's supposed to be like a tarot card thing where they, like, tell you your future, I guess? You'd think that the booklet would give you a more accurate description of what each card means, but it doesn't quite really. It's about as vague as what the game tells you. Now one thing that's concerning about the manual are these random messages. There's warnings, telling players to play at their own risk, and even the claim that Taboo isn't a game at all. What have I got myself into? It's probably nothing. So whatever, forget the booklet, let's just play the game. Viewed by others, you are prosperity and success. Huh, well, that sounds pretty good. Let's see what the next card says. Near future influencing you soon is to be taken advantage of false friends or being misled? What the heck? What's that supposed to mean? Attainable at this time is... Oh my god, is, is that a coffin? Um... Uh, you know what? Why don't we play something else? Yeah, uh, what about... Oh... Mario! Good old Mario! Yeah, let's, uh, let's, let's try that! Okay, starting over, new review, play the intro. Alright, Super Mario Bros. was released for the NES in 1985 in North America. The game pioneered what great side-scrolling platformers could do, with its tight controls and... <laughs> well, these old games could be a little finicky once in a while. Resetting should fix it. Anyway, so Super Mario Bros. What's going on here? Hmm. Well, sometimes you gotta do a little extra maintenance. Okay, now... Wait, what? This, this doesn't look right. Is... Do, is my game possessed? What the hell? Why... Why does the music sound like that? Why is... What's going on? It's because I didn't finish that taboo game, isn't it? Fine, I'll do it. Just stop this nonsense. So like I said before, taboo works sort of like a tarot reading. The screens that show the cards are structured like this. On the top is the category of the card, which is supposed to fit a certain situation. Then there's the type of card, and then a description of what that card is supposed to represent for that specific situation. But even knowing all this, it doesn't exactly explain why my games are suddenly being possessed. Okay, let's just get this over with. The influences of the distant past are looked to the occult rituals, religion, or ceremonies for support? Oh my god. This game really is possessed. What have I done? Next card. The existing obstacle is a sudden or complete change. Uh, yeah, like my NES becoming possessed? Yeah, that's, that's a pretty sudden change. Your forthcoming influence is disappointment or abandonment. Your secret fears or wants are a change in surroundings or situation. Oh man. Okay, one card left. What's it gonna say? The conclusion of the issue is capable of deep concentration, study, and reflection. Huh? Fortune numbers? What is this, a fortune cookie? No enemies, no challenges, no anything. All of that scary buildup just for that? And that was Taboo the Sixth Sense. It was uh, kind of strange, kind of disturbing, but it's not really a game. But to be fair, the manual does say that itself. I just, I'm not sure what to say about this, but one thing I do have to say is, if 
If you start playing it, don't stop. Because you don't know what can happen. The Apollo moon landing was a huge leap in the American scientific uh, space program. And uh, it was really interesting with all uh, the space and uh, the spaceship. Ugh, man. I got this test on this space rocket stuff and it's way too boring. I, I just can't take this. <sighs> if only there was an easier way to learn about this stuff. It... Wait a second. That's it. Space Shuttle Project for the NES. I always knew I could count on Nintendo to teach me stuff. Just like that one time it taught me how to use a keyboard. K, D, 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 K, D, uh, J, J, uh, F. Man, I'm gonna be typing fast in no time. Well anyways, let's pop this thing in and see what being an astronaut is really like. Huh, made by Absolute. Must be some educational game company or something. Oh wow, right away the game starts off with your astronaut application. See, this is definitely the real deal, folks. But, um, is that supposed to be me? It looks less like an astronaut and more like an alien trying to look like one. Oh well, I guess that space training must be tough. So, what are we doing? I guess it's randomly deciding my space ID number and ship model or something? Wait, hmm, something's not right here. It's not letting me get past this screen. Oh, I see. It's not random at all. It flashes the information first, and then I have to memorize it and input it in the correct order. I should have known. Any old schmuck can't just send an application to be a spaceman. Unfortunately, every time you screw this up, you lose a life. And you only start off with five lives per mission. That's right, you can lose lives before the mission even starts. So make sure to enter that info carefully. Next up, it's time to fuel and board the space shuttle. It's pretty self-explanatory. You take the elevator, and the glowing objects let you know where you need to go and what you need to do. After you've done all that, you just need to go pick up your co-pilot and bring him back to the ship. There's a time limit though, so be sure to do it quickly. Also, those levers from earlier activated these things that go back and forth and can hinder the progress of the elevator and make you lose some time. Wow, you'd think that the scientists who built this thing would have put those things somewhere else, right? So now we're on to stage two of the mission, the space shuttle launch. All you have to do here is roll 120 degrees, do the SRB separation, main engine cutoff, ET, uh, uh we'll figure it out. Whoa, we're inside of a real spaceship. Just look at all these panels and monitors. Sure enough, the spaceship launches and we're on our way. Now, you might think that you'd control this like any other space shooter or airplane game at this point, but you'd be wrong. This isn't just a game, but a realistic simulation. That is to say, there's a quick time event style thing you have to do during launch. That's right, before Resident Evil 4, before Shenmue on Dreamcast, before all that, there was quick time events and space shuttle project for NES. So yeah, the events themselves are pretty intuitive for the most part. The most basic one is simply pressing A, or one of the directional buttons, when the meter lines up to the right spot. Another common one is moving the bottom arrow left and right to meet the top one as quickly as possible. You might mess up once or twice the first time you encounter these since you don't know exactly what you're doing at first, but you should find them very easy to deal with after that. Once again, you should be careful, as one mistake equals one loss of life, just as with the data input part in the beginning. Some of these quick time events even help you gain an extra life if you do them correctly the first time, but it's usually on the more challenging ones that you'll face later on in the game. Once you've completed that section, you're on to stage 3, the actual space mission itself, which seems to consist of putting a new satellite into orbit. Alright, let's do it. Now, this part is simple enough. You just press A to release the satellite, and then maneuver it into the correct position in orbit. Oh, and uh, look out for the other satellites. They'll cost you a life if you hit one, and you'll have to start the stage all over again. You may also notice these things that look like floating turrets from Portal or something, but brushing past these actually gives you an extra life. I don't know why, but good to know. The controls here are a little odd at first since the satellite has this sort of inertia to it, which makes it take a while to speed up and slow down, but it's not too difficult. You just gotta release it on top of the screen, and you're good to go. Wait, what? Oh, okay. 
So the satellite actually takes a little while to activate and start floating, so it needs a lot of space when you release it. That makes things a little harder. All right, come on, come on, open, open. Phew, that was close. But hey, that means I completed the mission. All right. Wait, stage four? Oh, that's right. I completed the mission, but now I've actually got to land back on Earth. Wow, they're not pulling any punches with this game. Luckily, the landing process just consists of another quick time event section, which you've already dealt with before. Whoa, it didn't have all these flashing colors last time, though. What's going on here? Is my co-pilot drunk or something? Frickin' moon beer? Well, all you have to do is make it through despite your inebriated co-pilot, land the ship, and you're home free. Look, you even made it in the newspaper. After that, you get a password that lets you skip straight to the second mission next time you want to play. Mission 2 is starting construction on a space station. Wow, cool. The stage 1 here starts the same as the last mission, except this time you need to board a mission and payload specialist along with your co-pilot. That means that you really have to make the most of your time and try to do things quickly. Once liftoff begins with stage 2, you'll be introduced to a new quick time challenge, the valves. This basically just serves as a Simon Says type of thing. You memorize which circles flash in what order, and repeat. Everything else is pretty much the same, so if you're able to complete the last mission, you should be okay here. What isn't the same, however, is stage 3. This time, you have to carry these metal squares to the correct spots in order to build the space station. Once you've placed a square in the correct position, you just head back to your spaceship to pick up the next one. Once again, your controls have this sort of weight to it, so you need to be extra careful and avoid the satellites in your path. Like that one. You can't do things too slowly, however, since you have a limited amount of oxygen, which you can refill using these canisters placed on either end of the level. The best strategy here is to analyze how quickly the objects are flying by and try to judge when to charge through. Also, watch out for these steel beams that can get in your way and delay you further. How's it going, turret? Once you've placed the final square, you just gotta get back to your ship and begin your journey home. Once again, it's similar to the last mission, except now you have another challenge added. This time you need to correctly align the outline of the spaceship by quickly sliding it in the correct direction and pressing A. Other than that, you basically just land as normal. Mission 3 adds two more people to your crew, the scientist and the engineer. I'm not really sure why they had to come too, maybe they just wanted to impress their friends or something? Just as with the boarding, there's two more quick time challenges added to the takeoff section. First, there's tracking. You simply follow the waveform with the d-pad from beginning to end. This is honestly my least favorite segment, because it isn't challenging at all, and it takes forever. The second new challenge they add is this vernier thing. It's a lot better. You wait for this opening to slow down in front of your arrow, and then press up or down to go through without touching the sides. It feels very satisfying for some reason. The mission here is to retrieve a satellite from orbit and to make repairs to it, so all you have to do is avoid all these asteroids, grab the satellite, and return to the ship. If an asteroid hits you, then it won't take a life, but it will cost you some time. Which makes me wonder, why the hell did they decide to leave a satellite around all these asteroids anyway? Well, as long as you're careful enough, you should be able to get the satellite no problem. Now all I have to do is return it to the ship. I think. Come on, get in there. I'm running out of oxygen. What am I supposed to do with this thing? For a while, I just wasn't sure what was going on, but apparently the game is just very finicky about re-entering the ship on this level. It took me a little while, but I finally got in there. The last part is the same old, same old. Do the challenges, land your ship. And look at that, the president even compliments your crew on a successful mission. <laughs> I should have become an astronaut a long time ago. Mission 4 begins ramping up the difficulty right at the beginning. Not only do you have your new six-man crew to board, but the obstacles that run back and forth go by more quickly, and there's also been five seconds cut off the timer. This leaves you very small room for error, forcing you to be very efficient. This time, there's only one more challenge added to the launching segment, called Gimbal. Here, you simply press A when the meter has reached the right area of the meter, and B once it's hit the left area. I'm not sure why this was added so late in the game, as it's not very challenging, but at least it's less boring than the tracking segment. Once you actually get to space, you'll find that you've returned to the space station construction from earlier. The challenge here has been increased as well, including more squares that have to be carried a longer distance, a section with these laser walls that will cost you a life, and more satellite obstacles that are strategically placed in order to trick you into crashing right into them. 
The main trick here is patience. It may take a while to take every single square from the ship to the construction site, but don't feel tempted to rush. It's a surefire way to mess up and lose a life. And being low on lives makes the landing sequence at the end much more stressful than usual. Just one mistake could cost you the entire mission. And speaking of missions, this next one's pretty big. Rescuing a marooned Soviet cosmonaut. This boarding segment increases the speed of the obstacles even more and adds one final member to your crew, a physician. It's pretty tough to board everyone in time, but not impossible. There aren't any new challenges added to the launching phase this time, but some of them are made more difficult, particularly the Simon Says valves. The main mission this time may be the coolest one yet. You simply avoid the countless obstacles as you make your way upwards to rescue your fellow spaceman. I still don't understand why all these satellites were placed near an asteroid field, but whatever I guess. Once you reach the stranded cosmonaut, oh, whoops, well at least it starts you back up there. So yeah. At this point, all you need to do is get back to your ship before your oxygen runs out and you're home free. Hmm, they should make a movie out of this. At this point, the landing segment should be a cakewalk, and after that, the cosmonaut is saved. And here's good old Gorbachev to give you his thanks. Wait, hold on a second. So the Cold War ended when the Soviet Union collapsed in 1991, and this game came out in... 1991. Did I just end the Cold War? Huh, well, anyway, final mission. The boarding segment here makes the last missions look like a tutorial. At this point, you basically need to be a speedrunner in training if you want to board in time. Speaking of speedrunning, I even figured out my own trick. If you quickly push the opposite direction of where you're trying to go when the obstacle's about to hit you, it will actually push you towards your destination. Pretty cool. The launching part is basically the same as last time, but when you actually reach your destination, you may be a bit disappointed to see that the final mission leads you back to the space station yet again. One of my favorite things about this game is how it continuously changes things up from mission to mission, so I'm not a big fan of this. When it comes to final missions though, I can definitely see why they decided to put this last. It is tough. If the last mission tested your patience, like waiting for a package to come from out of the country, then this is like waiting for a package to come while you're on the moon. It just seems to go on and on. The difficulty comes less from straight up challenge and more from an endurance aspect. Over time you start to fall into a trance, and eventually you're just bound to zone out and make a mistake. You can't speed things up by rushing either, as that only increases your chances of losing more lives. You really have to take it slow. Alright, final part is placed. Just gotta get back now, but I don't have any lives left. Damn, just one mistake and it's over. Whoa, that was close. Phew, okay, now I just have to land back on Earth. Normally this part doesn't worry me, but I can't afford to mess up even once. Come on. Come on. Ooh. Jeez, I did it. And what's the reward after such a huge stressful mission? Well, the president has a fireworks show in your honor. I think I earned it. And that's it. No end credits or anything. Though, to be fair, they do show you some credits during the opening. Hmm, David Crane. Where have I seen that name before? Oh, right, right. He made a boy in his blob. Why do I remember that game? Oh, uh, never mind. Wow, Space Shuttle Project. Well, for a later NES title, the graphics are pretty good, the controls well enough, and the missions throw enough variation at you that it keeps it interesting throughout. Some people might get sick of the frequent quick time events, but I think they're pretty good, and they actually add some difficulty to them as the game progresses. There's a few minor flaws, like when you're trying to figure out what to do in certain missions, but you could usually figure it out pretty quickly. And if you can't, the game's password system makes it so you can save your progress. Overall, I liked it a lot. And the best part is, I'm basically a certified astronaut now. I gotta send my application to NASA right away.